Hello and welcome to Watch It Baptist Church Online. My name's Mike, I'm the pastor at Watch It Baptist Church and you're very welcome joining us for this session. This is part three in a series on mission and each of those parts have been called Be Something. But up to now we've had um, Be Ready, uh, which was a kind of a kind of a preface, kind of an, an early extra. And then we've also had um, Be His, and that was another one. Oh, it's gone clean out of my head. I'm sure you can look it up. This one is Be Present, and we're looking at Acts chapter 17 for this, which I'm going to read in just a moment. Um, but this continues our look at what it means to be followers of Jesus, to be apprentices of Jesus in the world, uh, alongside other disciples, and looking to make Jesus known in the ways that make the most sense and are the most helpful and are the most appropriate to the way in which the Bible shows, Jesus shows, how we might share his good news, his kingdom, with a world that needs to know him. So let's pray and then we'll read this passage. Lord Jesus, we long to follow you. We want to be people who are recognisable as those who follow you. We want to be recognisable as those who love one another as well and as those who care for the world. And with all those things held together, we ask that you would instruct us, that we would be ready to being told how this is supposed to work by you. And so I ask that anything that I say that's unhelpful might not land, and anything that I say badly that needs to be heard is taken to heart. We pray for the blessing and guidance of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so reading Acts 17, verses 16 to 33, and they go something like this. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he gives himself, rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. 
Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Okay, so today's session will finish with three questions, but it's also structured around three questions and they're different questions. Oh, sorry about that. There are two sets of three questions, one that's going to help me organise what I think God is wanting to say to us through this passage, and the other is to help us reflect at the end of the session. So the three questions that I'm looking at are these. Number one, why does mission need to change? Number two, what happens when mission changes? And number three, what do different approaches to mission look like? So let's do the first one first. Why does the mission need to change? Now, it may be that one or two of you are thinking, Mike, what do you mean this is outrageous? God is just God. The mission doesn't change because God doesn't change. Why would the mission need to change if God remains the same? Well, the thing is that God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. But the way he does things does change. The approach varies because people change and times change, because the message of the good news in the kingdom goes to different cultures, they have different ways of thinking at different times in history. The mission changes according to the language people speak. And I don't just mean you know, whether it's German or French, but actually the kind of ways in which people communicate and, and the assumptions that they make too, and the framework that people have for their lives. To reach people, God takes different approaches. And this is thoroughly biblical. Let me explain what I mean. In Numbers chapter 22, which some of you may know, we have the only, the only talking animal in the Bible. God, in his need to speak to Balaam, made a donkey talk. God will and does change his approach according to situations. So for Israel, he sent Moses as a rescuer. And then the very next leader was Joshua, who was a general. Ehud and Deborah were both provided as judges. David was a king. Elijah was a prophet. God is prepared to do things differently at different times according to the circumstances and the people. And sometimes they're done very differently, even outrageously differently. It's important here that when we say the mission changes, we remember that the mission is God's mission, not ours. God's mission carried out by God's principles and by God's people. But it doesn't become our mission, it's always his. Jesus spoke to different people in different circumstances. Before his execution on the cross, he talked to Pilate about kings. He talked to everyday people about how to respond to Roman occupation. When people were hungry, he fed them. And yes, he added spiritual meaning to that, but it was still an example of how to approach people according to their circumstances, in a way that fitted a particular time and a particular situation. And this is something God passes on to us, to adapt according to circumstances. You see, moving out of a biblical way of understanding, we might look at it like this. When we teach children about money, we generally speaking don't start with um, hedge funds or, or pension annuities or um, investment portfolios. Instead, we start with uh, how many sweets can you buy for 50p? You know, if you, you buy seven sweets and they're five pence each and you take 50p with you, how much change do you have? I let you work that one out for yourselves, quite apart from wondering how on earth anybody can afford sweets of 5p anymore. We don't explain money by talking about complicated things with children. We use simpler things. Now, if somebody from the United States came to this country, there might be some particular things we would want them to understand. Maybe roundabouts or fish and chips, uh, or cricket, um, or the BBC proms. Things that are culturally specific to some cultures and not so much to others. For anyone who lives in central London, we might want to introduce them to the concept of silence, or cows, or trees, or um, dark sky reserves like we have on Exmoor. Different people have different basic ideas, foundational concepts of what normal is like. And that is the product of the culture that they are from. 
And that culture might not be as broad as you think. So it's not the case that we have one culture for white British people, one culture for West African black people, one culture for South Asian people as well. That's not the case. Even people who are the same age as us, speaking the same language as us, from the same hometown as us, who like the music that we like, may still have a different cultural normal because of their educational circumstances or their family background. Maybe they had a stricter upbringing than we did. Maybe, maybe they went to a school that was more diverse than ours was. See, our, our cultural situation the situation of our life varies, and so it is the idea of normal that varies too. And so the mission of God will look different for each of us. And Paul, in Athens, in Acts 17, wanted to reach philosophers and thinkers. So he used their language and their version of normal, not his own. This is so important for us to remember. Because the kingdom and the good news... The way of Jesus is for everyone, but will be different from person to person almost. For, for somebody who has suffered physical abuse as a child, God's mission is for them and their situation. For um, someone who feels that God uh, can't be a father because their experience of a father is distant and cold, God's mission is still for them and their situation. That might be different from those who are wealthy and have big affluent families. And that will be different from those who face the bleakness of poor mental health. And that will be different from those who are estranged from family and friends. God's mission is for each one in their own situation. And it's the same good news, but it will be different as an experience for different people in different cultural circumstances. And that means we don't get to tell them what the good news ought to look like to them. This can be challenging for us, particularly if our expectation or our experience, maybe, of how the good news works has been consistently the same thing that we've heard through our lives. Or perhaps it's different from our own experience. If you're somebody whose introduction to Jesus was like mine about conviction of sin, you might struggle with the idea that for somebody else it might be about release from um, abuse or liberation from captivity of some kind. For some it'll be about healing, for others it'll be about moving from chaos to order. All of these things are good news, but they are not the same. Jesus described his mission in many ways, and he knows what the world needs. And we get to play a part in his mission, but to do so we need to know what mission is and what it means in different cultures and context and places. So question one you might remember was this, why does the mission need to change? And the answer is because people and situations and cultures are all so different and even with the gospel one size does not fit all. Now my second question is this, what happens when the mission changes? Imagine arriving at a pub in a bright blue England cricket top. And imagine that half the people, two thirds of the people in that pub are wearing yellow and speaking with clear twangy Australian accents, beautiful as they are, and drinking particularly um, Southern Hemisphere type lagers maybe. It might be difficult to feel as much at home and it's likely that the Aussies might be welcoming but wouldn't so much see you as one of their own. In our reading, the Acts 17 reading that we had at the start, Paul, who's an apostle, which means a sent one, did two crucial things. He adapted his pattern and he adapted his reference points. You see, Paul always preached in synagogues wherever he travelled and it was normal for him to be in marketplaces too. There was a good chance he was very much at home in the marketplace because he did have a trade. He was a leather worker, sometimes referred to as a tent maker. And while that was not the only approach he took, he did work to support himself in various places. So sometimes he would be in marketplaces a lot, in some locations, in other places not so much. But in Athens, he didn't stop at the market in the synagogue, he did them, but he also did a third location. When people showed an interest, he didn't say, you need to come to the synagogue to hear about this. 
he agreed to go with them to the debating hall, the Areopagus. He agreed to go and to talk to people on their terms, in their location, using their surroundings and their context as his starting point. He quoted their poets twice to illustrate his point. And that's like the equivalent for us would be quoting uh, a stand-up comic or a novelist or something like that or a TV show. He used things they said and their worldview to describe God. We are his offspring is said originally in poetry about Zeus. But Paul borrows it in order to give a picture of how God works. And Paul himself made his, his message entirely accessible by being prepared to change, to change location, to change cultural assumptions. His message was still good news. It was not watered down. It was not compromised. It was the same God, the same Jesus he was proclaiming. But he was willing to see the mission change to make sure the message could be heard. And that is so important for us. We know, don't we, particularly in recent years, how hugely important it is for politicians to be uh, in touch, you know, to, to have some sense of what normal is like. I seem to remember early on as Prime Minister, Boris Johnson was asked how much two pints of milk cost or something. And it, it was it, his answer was seen as an illustration. In fact, he was not in touch. We still want those who represent us, who speak for us or are supposed to be responding to our circumstances to understand what it's like for ordinary people like you and me. Perhaps it's more important than ever in this situation as prices rise and there are so many challenges financially. But we expect those who want to pass on information or instructions or a message to us to meet us on our terms, to speak our language and to know our context. We want an approach that recognises our situation and takes it seriously. We want politicians and advertisers and friends and even family to understand my situation, my culture, my context. And once they can show me that, then I will listen. Because until they can show me that, I'm assuming that they don't really know who they're talking to. And there's no assumption from me that what they're saying will matter to me. And Paul recognised that need in Athens 2,000 plus years ago, and Jesus recognised it in Judea too. If the church is going to be part of God's mission to the world, and I for one really want that to be the case, then the church needs to identify difference in context. It needs to not just to say, I know that your context is different from mine, but to say, I understand that context and that context, and maybe this one too. I get my head around some of that. Not everyone shares my culture or my aspirations or my assumptions. And even in our own fellowship, not even our own congregation of disciples, of apprentices to Jesus, not everyone shares the same context. And wasn't it always so? Jesus' very own 12 disciples did not share context. Yes, they had some language similarities. Yes, they probably were ethnically quite similar. You can't be sure of that. It was... Roman Empire and the Mediterranean was quite a melting pot of ethnicities, but they, likely they would have had quite a lot in common. But worldview was not the same. I've, I've spoken before about how you had this mix of um, self-employed guys in fishing and guys who had staff. You had um, a collaborator and uh, an insurrectionist or a terrorist. You had people who were from Galilee and those who were disparaging about Galilee. It's, it, one argument says that um, Judas Iscariot, the Iscariot bit, means he was from the south and the rest were from the north. So there is difference, potentially, all over that group. And Jesus recognised that and didn't, I believe, expect them all to handle the news, the good news, the same way. He's very patient with them, too, when he wasn't frustrated, or possibly even when he was frustrated. The church is going to be part of God's mission to the world. It needs to identify difference in context and be able to speak to different ways of being, different starting points in the people around us. 
So God's mission changes as many times as there are people almost, or has the potential to change that many times. And when it changes, when it changes, people listen. They start listening if it's spoken to them. Vincent Donovan, and I quote, uh, write a fantastic book about mission, having spent a lot of time with the Maasai in Africa. Uh, and he wrote this, I'm going to quote it. Evangelization is a process of bringing the gospel to people where they are, not where you would like them to be. When the gospel reaches the people where they are, their response to the gospel is the church in a new place. I'm going to say that again. Evangelization is a process of bringing the gospel to the people where they are, not where you'd like them to be. And when the gospel reaches the people where they are, their response to the gospel is the church in a new place. The church exists as a culturally relevant organism. That's my bit. He didn't say that. I'm saying that. When the mission of God carried out by the church responds to context, then people actually listen. We need to be incredibly careful about saying anything like this. Well, people just need to come back to God and all will be well. How will they come? If they need to come back, where have they gone? How are we going to find them in that place? How are we going to find that place? If they're in the wrong place, who is going to go, take them by the hand and lead them to where they need to be? How are you going to persuade them to trust you to lead them? If they don't understand the message, how are you going to translate it? Or who are you going to find who can translate it? If the good news for some people as words makes no sense, how are you going to get it painted or turned into poetry or turned into video or turned into TikTok or Instagram Reel? How will they come? And if we fall back on people just need to come back to God, then we are completely missing the point of what Paul worked so hard at doing when he was alone, lonely, without his companions in Athens, waiting for them to show up and going into the lion's den of a philosophical discussion hall in order to get the message of Jesus to people. In Romans 10, we read this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now that was written by this same Paul who did his Athens talking. He knew what it meant to be sent. We are to be sent. He knew what it was like to need to speak to people in their language, on their terms and in their context. He spoke to people as they are surrounded by their own fears and doubts and struggles, their own certainties, even if they don't feel certain to us. And that's what makes the feet beautiful. The willingness to bring the good news, to preach it and declare it both in what you say and in what you do. And not on your own terms, but on the terms of those who you really know need to hear what is being said and that's all he was doing all Paul was doing he spoke the language of those he wanted to tell he spoke Areopagus language to those who were in the Areopagus in fact Paul goes on to explore a little bit more about that in 1 Corinthians 9 let me quote this one too to the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews to those under the law I became like one under the law though I myself am not under the law so as to win those under the law to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some, and I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. As Paul discovered, you still won't win everyone over. Some sneered, remember? Acts 17, was it 31, 32? But others wanted more because the good news reached them on their terms. How often we complain about people who want things to happen on their own terms. How selfish we feel that is. But it's exactly, it's exactly what God did for us by sending Jesus. He gave us, through his grace, a rescue on our 
turns. Every time Israel turned its back on God, he found another way. Israel didn't. God did. Every time we turn away from God, he looks for another way to reach us. And we need this. This is mercy and grace rolled up together. We need God's mission and we need God's grace and we need it on our terms. So we cannot and we must not deny it to others. Mission on their terms. And that doesn't mean watering it down. It doesn't mean making yourself a doormat. It doesn't mean putting yourself deliberately in harm's way. Although God might call you to go to some scary places. But what it does mean is saying, if we only share the gospel, we only share the good news, if we only walk in Jesus' footsteps on our own terms, that's not going to good to the world at all. You might remember last time that in, in the last session that we did, we were comparing the church to a road. And we said the church should be part of the way people reach God and that this means it gets trodden on and dusty and driven over and dirty. And here we can see how church is much more sort of winding lane than motorway. As we seek to bring Jesus' mission to wherever people are, we mustn't, mustn't, mustn't get frustrated if it takes time to travel, as it undoubtedly will. We may well spend more time in dense forest or desert as the road winds and climbs through these places than on the easier, smoother route that we might prefer. So, to answer our second question, what happens when mission changes? Well, people can hear it more clearly and it makes more sense to them. Now, I've been talking for a while now and I've just got to my third question, so I'm going to try not to linger too much on this one. I'm over 25 minutes and I am aware uh, of that. So I'm going to ask this final question. What do different approaches to mission look like? It's worth asking ourselves, what do we want mission to look like? Do we want it to be simple and predictable? And how do we feel about being messy and complicated? When Jesus fed 5,000 men and their families, it was messy. When Paul entered the Areopagus public debating chamber, it was scary. When we comfort those who mourn, it's delicate. When we encounter the poor, we can feel uncomfortable. When we leave behind our own culture, our own version of normal, we can feel very vulnerable, like being in a foreign land, like Paul was. But if we don't allow the mission to change, we might as well try to rescue someone who is drowning by throwing them a rope that isn't tied to anything. It'll be meaningless. What we need is a rescue point that connects. And when we're willing to change the message while holding to the truth, but without letting our barriers, without letting our normal become a barrier to others, then, then Jesus is heard. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, British missionaries overseas created churches that looked and sounded like British churches. They sang British hymns, and expected African and Asian people to dress and talk like churchgoers from England. In some places, church became grafted over their own identity, and some of those churches still operate today. It isn't just about meeting Jesus, it was about imposing a set of expectations that had little or nothing to do with good news to the poor, but were about imposing a culture, a, a foreign culture, and it, making that part of how grace was supposed to operate. So we mustn't do this. Allowing mission to change means that we can avoid mistakes like that. Paul didn't impose Jewish rules on the philosophers in Athens. He respected their understanding and looked for ways to show how Jesus made sense to their context. So we need to be brave enough to put down our own assumptions about what mission is and allow that mission to change. And we do this already in some ways. We do it in community meal. We do it through the prayer tent at the music festival. I'm hoping that we can do it at the sanctuary by providing a place of warmth and welcome this autumn and winter. These are places where we want to bring good news by taking it to where people are and not expecting them to come to us. A quick digression into Acts 10. Peter has to accept an approach to mission that includes the Gentiles. The outsiders have to be allowed in and they're allowed in not by coming into a synagogue but by Peter going to them and including them and involving them and listening. And there's an interesting Old Testament reminder too. In 2 Chronicles 30, I will be brief, Judah invites Israel to celebrate Passover. Israel's been, so we say, less faithful. Judah says, come and be part of this. The two kingdoms have been at war on and off for generations, but here the mission of God means inviting the old enemy. 
It means putting up with the scorn and ridicule, welcoming those who've been outside for years and worshipping with them, even if they were ritually unclean. That is literally what happens. Most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But King Hezekiah prayed for them and said, May the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets their hearts on seeking God, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even if they are not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard and healed the people. Not only did Judah welcome Israel in, they accepted them, even though they did things the wrong way. They made room for them as who they are. The road of mission is dusty, grimy and has worn out white lines, but Hezekiah puts the mission First, God wants to reach the world and he wants to do so through his people. And for us, that means the church. So the answer to question three, what do different approaches to mission look like? They look wonderful and different and messy and mucky and they reflect God. Very quickly, those three questions recapped. Why does the mission have to change? Because people are wonderfully different. What happens when the mission changes? People can hear it. And what does it look like when mission changes? Well, it looks messy and welcoming and very much like Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, would you hear our cry to be a mission people? Would you help us see where we need to put down our assumptions about how things ought to be, to set aside our church culture in order to be able to make sense to those who need you? Would you help us blend warmth and acceptance with truth? And would you help us to bring love through all of it? And we ask these things for the sake of your grace and your mercy, which reaches us on our terms. Amen. OK, as ever, we're asking three questions to help us reflect. And here's question one. In what ways can a church culture make it difficult for people to hear the message of Jesus? Question two, what other cultures do you need to be more familiar with if people are going to hear you talking about the good news? Question three, think of one person you know who doesn't know Jesus. How can you adapt the message to suit how they see the world? OK, that's it for today. I'm aware that the teaching was a little longer than I would normally make it. I hope you've been able to bear with me. And I hope that if you need to go back and listen to stuff again, you're able to find an opportunity to do that. Do spend some time with the questions. Let's keep thinking about how the mission, the good news of Jesus can be said and shown to the world around us. Amen.